Big Gap, episode 412 for Monday, January 15th, 2024. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Banzoogle, where the code Gig Gab EPK at Banzoogle.com will get you 10% off your first year of their new EPK plan subscription, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton, and my guest today is none other than Daniel East. Dan, thanks for coming back on the show with us. You know, all you have to do is ask. I, I love, did. I love hanging with you anywhere, same. anytime. You just tell me when, and I'm there. Uh, same. It's. Uh, I. I feel the same way, and it's great to have you back, man. How? Uh, so Nam is is coming up, right? Like we. T- I think the last time you were on the show was right after Nam of last year. I figured this would be a perfect opportunity. I, there's lots of things we have to talk about, but I. I want to know. I, so for our listeners. I want to know what the planning of going into Nam looks like for someone like you. And then selfishly, I have a hotel room booked for Nam. I just haven't booked flights yet. So there's a world where this episode is like, I had it on my calendar today to like, now that I'm back from CES, which was great. No, I have some things to talk about there from that. But now that I'm back from CES and I can like think and realize, okay, I'm, I didn't come back with the plague, so I'm not going to lose a week of work. Does it make sense to go to Nam? And so there's a world where I might. What's Nam planning like for how, you? How long have I been bugging you about coming to Nam, dude? Seriously, well, I, here's your chance. This, this is, is it. it. Yeah. Oh, this is a nice surprise. I'm <laughs> I'm excited. That's cool. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul's been been hanging around for a while, and it's always it's always awesome to see him when he was coming for a while. Yeah. And yeah, this is great. Okay, very cool. Nam this year is is shaping up. Is shaping up really nicely, actually, because it was the year that was out for COVID. There was right. the year following that was n- nothing, which I opted out of for the first time for somebody who's gone, you know, yeah, I'm on, I'm on 40 shows or something like now. And, um, and then last year, even though it was, you know, 50% more than it was the previous year that I didn't attend – what was really interesting was who showed, not who didn't show, because everybody was like, yep. oh, you know, Pearl's not Pearl's not here, and and PRS isn't here, and Gibson's not here. And I think I, I don't that doesn't help me knowing who's not here. Right. What helps me? <laughs> I could come up with a lo- huge <laughs> list of companies that are right. never going to be there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it was really it was really cool to walk around and find some cool stuff. Like we talked about after you know last yeah. year was on the show, we talked about it, and the the level of interaction and the time that you could take was really cool. This year is the first year under the new CEO, um, and I apologize if I'm butchering his name, uh, John uh, Milnicek, I believe. Okay. I'm not sure. Joe oh. Lamond had been there for years, a, a guy I loved and knew very well back to when he was a drummer, when he was a punk rock drummer, and was just ah, like the coolest guy. That's cool. And yeah. he stepped down, and John is, has some huge shoes to fill, and is, from what I can see, perception-wise anyway, He's put a lot into this to try to make this work really, really well and to see to it that there are some really great opportunities and reasons to attend this show. So last year's numbers of it for attendance, I thought, were were good. It wasn't great. I mean, again, it was only sure. that much better than when what anybody expected. No, I would and I and having been at CES, I, I basically did the same thing with CES that you did with NAM where I like I went last year for the first time post COVID lockdowns. They did hold it the year prior. They they held it in 2022, but it was like people bailed out at the last minute. It, there, it was, you know, it was right. a ghost town last year. It, I would have said the exact same thing you said about Nam, where th- you could make a list of the companies that chose not to go. But the people that were there were there in full force and you could have meaningful conversations. There was a little more time. And what I just came back from was like full on CES mania all the way back to what it was in 2020 and 2019 and, you know, all the years prior. So 
Yeah, this makes yeah. sense. Yeah, the evolution. So, I mean, it's the same. Yeah. Here's here's kind of the thing that makes the most sense to me, which is again by way of perception. And I, I mean, I go and I cover the show for different you know sure. media and stuff too. But f as the musician part of me, which uh, you know is is key, it seems like they're they're refocusing the the idea of Nam to be about development in a certain amount of areas. One is education. Okay. Another is obviously in industry and in MI and in development. And the other is in uh, actual business relationships. And I'm really excited about that. First of all, because for me, that's what it always was. For me, it was always about um, not just developing the businesses for the companies that I was consulting for, but it was for building relationships for me as a musician. Yeah. Because I've worn all the hats. You know, I did artist relations. I do it now for I do it now for Michael Tobias design for MTD basses and guitars. And um the thing about, you know, oh free stuff, free stuff. It's like no, that's those no. days are gone. Those yep. days are long, long gone. Yep. <laughs> but the other but the, component... but the, 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 the networking, the, the, right. the I, I always say, and again, I'll relate CES because I literally just got back. It, but anytime I go to any show, my primary focus is on relationship development, relationship right. maintenance, relationship management. And, and then there's all the other things, the coverage, all of that. It happens, but just because of who I am, and I think you and I are very similar in this way, we're, we're relationship people. We understand right. the value of it, certainly, if we're, if we're going to be you know objective about it, but it's also important to me. I like to develop relationships with people, so it's a natural thing, and it's just sort of how it goes. Yeah. And you have that, and, and it's, so it becomes like the greatest tour family reunion you've ever seen, and it's, it's not as many of it. So like we always say Saturday is Rockstar Day. Like if you want to see the person that you actually recognize the name, that's maybe they'll be there on Saturday. Okay. But all the rest of the time, musician wise, it's you'll recognize eighty percent of the people from you know Adam Blackstone's band or from sure. you know any number of like all the award shows, all the talk shows, all of the late night shows, like all those guys that are there in general working and doing demos and all that stuff. But there's also stuff like awards like tech awards and Parnelli awards and all that, all that fun stuff, which is, it's a great opportunity to do business because a lot of the corporate guys go and it's open bar and they're hanging out and you know, you can make deals all day long if, if you're in that part of the world of, yep. of music. So it's, it's fun. I love it. It's my only time during the year to actually go and do like, it's my vacation kind of, even though I work like a dog and I don't sleep. <laughs> right, it's, right. it's so much fun. I almost always have a playing gig and a mixing gig when I'm there, which is always super cool. And again, I've been doing it for so many years. There's some really cool stuff happening this year, which I'm excited about. So um, are you, uh, for any of our listeners who are going to be there, uh, are you playing and or mixing this year at NAMM? So, so this year, because it was kind of last minute for me, yep. I did not book anything. Got it. Specifically because I didn't know how long. I didn't know what was going to happen. Now, as it turns out, I'm going to be there long enough, and I should have. Of course, needless. Of to course, say. it's all it's always how, how it goes. Yes. yes. However, the cool stuff that's happening is um, every year Yamaha comes up with the main stage Saturday night show, and it's been Tower of Power. It's been Sarah McLaughlin. It's been they was Lawrence last year. Which is, if you haven't seen Lawrence, was great. Yep, uh, Lawrence is fun. A, I love that band. Yeah, super yes. super fun, crazy talented, just just over and the so top. much energy. Oh, yeah, so great, very 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 cool. I love the horns. I love yes. like just the whole vibe. It's like, it's it's. I said it was like. Um, it's like what Jamiroquai if, should have been if they weren't ahead of their time. <laughs> right. If I said I said if if Gwen Stefani and and. Uh, um, What's his? What's the guy's name who wrote Short People and all that stuff? Uh, Randy Newman. Yeah, yeah. If they had a band together, they're, they're brother and sister. They are brother and sister in, so, in Lawrence, it's, not it's so Gwen cool. Stefani and, yeah. and, no, and no, Randy no, no, Newman. No. Right, yeah, yeah, they're not brother and sister. Um, you know, it's crazy. Um, Great band. Of, if you yeah. haven't seen them, folks, I I I wound up stumbling onto them because of a YouTube video a couple of years ago. Yeah, everybody and did. Was obsessed. Yeah, I think we even talked about them in the show. But yeah, no, yeah, great they, band. They come from they come from industry parents, I believe. 
Ah, so there's makes some, sense. There's some, there's some yep. really cool stuff. We last last year we talked about Ali Handel and rag dolls and all that. This year is kind of going to be fun, and our our friend Buddy Gibbons is playing with um, uh, Stephen Kramer Glickman from Big Time Rush, and he's got some like some really serious stuff happening. And uh-huh. so Buddy will be playing. Is this is at cool. the Yamaha party, this or is this will, elsewhere? No, this will okay. be on the. So Yamaha is set up with like a certain number of stages. And okay. the primary stage is the Yamaha stage, which is right in the middle of the plaza. Got and it. And then the Marriott has a lobby stage and the Hilton has a lobby stage. And then there's an, an ancillary stage out behind the um, convention center. Got and it. And then each of the hotels, lounges or whatever in the area will do stuff. And then, of course, all the parties and all the crazy. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, that That's really cool. So it, the schedule's online. Uh, I'll send you the link for it. It's It's really, really cool. And... I just, I'm excited to see what happens. I mean, I, I, I've seen more interest in this show than I've seen in quite a while. And having been through Nam through so many iterations after, you know, 9-11 and thinking that, you know, Nam is over and then just going anyway and seeing it go and go and go and go, this really is not only the, the big test for the new CEO, but this is also potentially, you know, their make or break event. So they're going to want right. this thing popping oh, because okay. so many shows have, have, are just gone. Yes. I mean, it, trade shows are just becoming dinosaurs, unfortunately. It, it is unfortunate. I, I mean, I have always maintained that in-person interactions are far more meaningful than even, you know, Zoom interactions or, I mean, phone calls and Zoom are better than email, right? But, you know, each has their purpose, but the, in, the, the, the idea of sharing air with someone, it, there's, there's a different energy that happens there. Yeah. Even it's, if you get Namthrax, it's, it's yeah, like, right. like crazy, like Nam disease that everybody gets. Although I, I can honestly say, and knock on wood, I have not. <laughs> ever been sick from nam everybody i know everyone i know literally and i i am uh, but i'm also known for the guy who carries clorox wipes and hand sanitizer and all that crazy stuff because i'm weird like that you know so my my friend uh marcus baylor who's this amazing legendary drummer from the yellow jackets and he's with the baylor project now and everything and yeah he he's he calls it the lysol ministries (laughs) <laughs> is, everywhere you go, you have you have an allotment. It's in the rider. It's everywhere you go. Yeah. You make sure yeah. there's Lysol. Hotel room, as soon as you get there, you don't touch anything. Bags, everything gets sprayed. And I've been doing this for years because it's I'm just it's not even an OCD thing. It's just that I because everybody I know got sick. I was like, you know, I could probably do something to keep that from happening to me. You know. <laughs> so I I have this thing uh, that was taught to me by Doctor Flash Gordon. Yes. I do you I know, know about do you know oh, Dr. Flash? Oh, I know okay. Flash through through the here organization. Oh, okay. So He's Flash is is a San Francisco f- figure and we'll we'll leave it at that. But he is actually a physician. He has his monkey poop theory. And you know, he 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 shares this story very colorfully and uh and says, you know, it's it's almost like sick people come into my office when they're sick and it's like, "Yes, Flash, that's why they they come to see you." And he said, so I needed to find a way to avoid getting sick. And he said, I, I know that by and large, the holes in our face, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, those are the vectors by which all of these things get in 99% of the time. There's other ways, but that's basically the path in. He said, so, and 99% of that time, it's our hands that bring those germs to our faces. So he has his monkey poop theory. When he is interacting with people, he thinks of his hands as though he has been working with monkey poop all day. And by remembering the monkey poop on his hands, he doesn't touch his face Never. until he has washed That's his hands. Right. And I adopted the monkey poop theory going into, I had a conversation with Flash about a month and a half ago and he shared his monkey poop theory. And so I adopted this going into CES last week. And I wasn't a hundred percent about it. Like you, you know, you have it's so easy to touch your face all the time. Oh, However, yeah. it seems to have worked because here I am, four or five days past CES, and nothing seems to be brewing. So right. success, yeah. yeah. 
And yeah. the, the, the thing about that too is I don't over hand sanitize either. There's a certain no. amount of bacteria that you need. It's good and for I you. I know that you can go crazy over this, yeah. but yes, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm very careful, um, to, to, if I have to do anything, it's, it's here. Yeah. And you know, Dan's, and, Dan's rubbing his, his, his and, arm against his yes, nose for those of you that yeah, aren't watching like, the video. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you just have to be careful and yes. especially, you know, look to, to not completely get off track from, you know, the people <laughs> oh, who watch we're this off show. Track. <laughs> yeah. We've, we always go off the rails. Um, the, the thing about some of this is that when you're a musician and you're used to being in public or you're in a crew and crew and you do production work or whatever it is, yeah. you do sound, whatever you're, you're used to dealing with. And people are constantly immediately reaching hands out. You know, they want to, they want to shake hands, whatever. And that's fine. And fist bumping is all cool and everything else. At the same time, um, I try to be respectful of that. I won't turn somebody away who like comes over to shake my hand, but I will go and wash up if I I need to, you know? Yeah. And trade shows are notorious because you're not dealing with 500 or a hundred or a thousand people. You're dealing with, you know, potentially tens of thousands of people in the course of a day. And at some point you may desensitize to the fact that, okay. Anyway, not to get so gross that we're going into like the sanitary issues of a trade show and anything like that, but, but gigs are, gigs are potentially worse because, you know, sometimes people are hammered and, you know, (laughs) get into a whole different thing. They want to hug you. They want to hug and all that. Yep. Exactly. By the way, speaking of gigs, I I got a little bone to pick with you. Not a bone to pick with you. Something to, an observation. Pick the bone. So I noticed that since, since Paul has sort of stepped back a little bit, in the last few shows, because I loved the, sh- I loved listening to everybody who's been on. You talked about like having various buzzes going on at different gigs. I was like, wait a minute, you waiting for Paul to leave to have these conversations on the show? You're like, <laughs> well, I'm not saying there's any alcohol consumption going on. I was like, wait a minute, what? And then you're like, yeah. And then there was this time being high on stage. I was like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> like, I don't Paul's know why gone. that never came up. I, you know, it, gone. I'm going to talk pro- about it all now. No, <laughs> I think we did. I know with Paul, we <laughs> talked about the Macworld All Star Band gig that was the, I believe, the last one before we started doing our own parties. It was at a place <laughs> called the Lone Star Saloon in San Francisco, which I believe has since closed. That it was somebody else's party. Um, and but the Macworld All Star Band was playing. That for whatever reason the band didn't start until like I don't think the party started until nine, and the band didn't start till like eleven. We got there at whatever six or seven, did our setup and sound check or you know whatever that was. Then we went down the street to have pizza for dinner, a couple of beers with pizza for dinner. Then back to the club. Now it's barely nine o'clock. They're letting people in. Paul says to me and and our friend Chris Breen, who's also been on the show here. He you know, says, "I love Chris. A saint. He's the legend." He is a legend. Guy. He's such a good human. I, after he was on with you, by the way, I texted him. And oh, great. And we reconnected just for time. Oh, yeah, I'm so was glad. just so cool. Yeah. But Paul says, so two beers, then probably get another beer when you get to the club. And then Paul says, we should do a shot of tequila to celebrate our gig. And it was like, okay. This was the first gig I ever played with Chris, by the way. <laughs> so maybe it wasn't the last of the, but anyway, it was, you know, it was not our party. And then You know, two hours later, I walk on stage and realize I have had nine drinks. There you go. That's a lot for me. Like, like a lot for me. I, I surprised I made it to the drum stool. And that's when I looked at the set list and realized, oh crap, I'm singing the first song. It was eight days a week by the Beatles. The fact that I remember any of this shows you how much trauma I was in for it because I should not have remembered a thing from that gig. But uh, evidently it went fine, but nice. that was, I, I don't like being hammered on stage. And no. I definitely was that night. I mean, there's no, there's no question. I, I had a rule, uh, uh, you know, my background, I've been doing this since I was a kid. And, and one of the reasons why I never really got into any of that is because I worked with a, a, an amazing producer who, who was this legendary guy and, and said, anything that becomes the excuse for why you mess up on stage, don't do that. Just, yep. just don't do it. And so yep. immediately I was like, well, and I was never, I was, I'm just not that person. I never really was, but it, I never got into it. And so when I was on the road myself or when I was tour managing, I had a rule. I'm like, when you're on the clock, 
not there's nothing like there's no yeah. alcohol there's no there's no drugs there's no nothing and this was years ago you know like sure. this is the rule that's it if you if you don't want to comply that's up to you i may not be the guy for this gig you know yep and it it happened once in particular where um uh, the band got upset it was uh, i was tour managing for this band i wasn't playing and uh they fired me on the spot in wow. the middle of of uh where were we in like <sighs> I want to say like in Michigan or something. I don't know. And it's just, there was like, you're done. Then forget it. And I was like, okay, fine. We'd, we'd had a few months in things were going sure. really, really well. Tour was awesome. They were at the time they were, you know, the band du jour and everything. And like, cool, this is great. So I just went home. I was like, forget it. Yep. And like three weeks later, the management office called me and they're like, we need you back. And I said, <laughs> what are you talking about? She's like, the reviews are horrible. They're, oh. they're not showing up. They're not making money. We're not selling merch. And radio's dropping off and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm sorry, you can't afford me. <laughs> she oh. says, I think we can. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I'd said, like to find oh. out. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they effectively, you know, basically doubled my pay. Yeah. And, uh, and then went back and then had the band like, and this I didn't like, but they had the band like, that's why I don't want to say who it is. Sure. No, I they, get it. Yep. They had them line up and apologize to me. And I was like, this was like a pretty well known. This was a very well known, and I was like, "This is not cool. Like, you can't do this, to these people. Like, this is not right." Yeah. So, right. so after all that, like formality and everything, everybody gets on the bus, and I, I like, I walked on the band bus, and I was like, with everybody, and I said, um, "Listen, what you do on your own time is your own business. But here's what's going to happen: we're going to get back to business." And the first down day, I'm taking everybody out. I'm taking everybody out. I'm taking the yep. whole band. I'm taking everybody, the crew, everybody. This is, we're not starting this way. This is not. Yeah, right. Way. No, you can't start that like, way. You got to live with these people. No. And this is, and, yeah. and, and yes, I have a very high expectation, especially at this level. We ended up coming in and this again, back in, you know, nineties or whatever this was, we came in like five or $6,000 under budget because we made wow. so much money after that. Wow. My, so they had like tracked the accountants came back and thanked me and said like, That's hey, good. you know, yeah. So yeah. Uh, now, I, do I have a problem with somebody who has a few beers on stage? No, I don't care. Like I, that's, Same. that's not the thing. When it yeah. becomes the impediment that, that becomes your excuse for why you had a bad night. Just don't do that. Like that, whatever yeah. that is. And that's a life my, thing. My feel. Yes. My feeling with it is I, I, and I, and I don't, I, I, I am careful not to use the phrase. I don't care. Cause I, I generally do care about people and especially bandmates and, and that like if somebody has a problem, I do care about that. But where it doesn't bother me is as long as you can do your job on stage and leading up to being on stage and leading, you know, off, off stage, as long as you can conduct yourself like the professional that you need to be right. and that I need you to be, I'm fine with you choosing whatever you want. Like, right. If I'm not judging anybody. No. Know. And, and like, you wouldn't want me as your drummer to have caffeine on stage. You wouldn't want me no. as your friend to have caffeine because caffeine and me don't get along very well. Um, it, we, I, I say that it further reduces my tolerance for humanity. And yes, that's plus, not in plus I turn into, you know, squirrel. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but, but like, I know that about me, so I don't do that before I go on stage. Right. And, you know, if, like you said, if somebody wants to have a couple of beers and, 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 and they can still perform at the level that they need to perform, right. great. I, I, I have plenty of bandmates, you know, over the years who love to smoke weed when they go on stage. As I mentioned in that episode with Mike, that is not me. And boy, did I learn that the hard way. But that's okay. Like, right. it's, it, I, I, I don't. Even though it's not for me on stage, if it is for someone else, again, as long as you can do your job, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but, no, wait. Yeah. So you mentioned like having pizza like before that gig and everything else. Yeah. Like, and that's that's actually something I, I had an idea for a new segment on the show. Okay. Okay. Because okay. and it's it's come up before. I've talked about it with you. I know you, Paul, have talked about it. Is I have I have this idea for grub get. Oh like what do you not eat? What do you eat before the gig? What do you do if it's like bar food and they, you know, either feed you or don't feed you? Like, I, I was thinking about this. I'm like, you know, like, wh 
there are so many things now i know because you and i both are the over preparers of all time <laughs> i i keep what's a, that supposed to mean <laughs> i have a i resemble I carry, that remark that's right you do and yeah. we know each other a long time but, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i carry uh protein bars and uh i carry stuff in case a because i have allergies to stuff so i'm really careful you know, like food sure. allergies okay and not yep. like i don't have like dangerous like anaphylaxis anaphylactic that's good level stuff but um i know what i can and can't have and another thing i thought would be kind of fun is like you know what's like what's the best gig food you've ever had like what's the bet like have you done like not weddings like of course yeah weddings and corporate gigs you know you're fed well but yeah. like there are a couple of places there are a couple of gigs that i've done uh just playing out locally uh you know here in in south florida at some crazy like waterside places where they have unbelievable like michelin star restaurant places and somebody said they wanted the, you know a band to play and they put together you know this band or whatever and like and i'm sure the van band guys can t t attest to this sure. and by the way i've heard from them since being oh, on the show and we've connected a little bit and they're, they're cool. one of their bass players is my buddy johnny hayes who's amazing ah. i've known since he was a kid and he's awesome and he's in their rotation of bass players so yep. yeah, it's johnny yep. hayes bass and by the way johnny hayes goes by both names i i have decided this for years since he was a kid he is the only person i know who only goes by johnny hayes. he's johnny hayes that's one word it's oh it's johnny one hayes. word i got yeah. you yes <laughs> No, so as for gig food, I love this grub gab thing. This is great because it like it's it's one of those things. I always tell people, you know, guests that are coming on the show, they like, oh, I don't have interesting stories. I'm like, you don't have stories that are interesting at your neighborhood cocktail party, but you do have stories that slay in the green room. That's what's actually interesting here, right? And so. The grub gab would be super boring for most of our neighbors. And yet everybody that's listening right now is like, Oh, I want to hear grub gab. Um, I certainly have played gigs where I, and I, I'm thinking about like what the, what foods are good for me to eat before a gig and what are after if we can, or what are bad for me to eat before a gig. And I've played gigs with great food. And of course we played gigs with, you know, awful food. Right. My favorite gig food story though, does come from playing a wedding. Uh, that this place nearby here called Wentworth by the Sea, super high dollar old money place on the you know ocean here, it, classic like old money New England. It, whatever awesome. you have in your mind for that, that's this place. So much so that like when we're getting there and setting up, you you can move in the common areas. But once guests start to arrive, and there's multiple function rooms at this place, once guests start to arrive. As the band, you must like use the back hallways and and move through the kitchen because they can't ever see you. It's it's like it again, just old money, old mentality, and uh, it's fine, right? You you know this going in, or you learn it the first time, and then it's like whatever. So they set up the band. They set up one of the unused function rooms for the night as like the band's green room. This is generally how it goes. So we're in this green room. I played this place many times. And that's where they have a table set up and they're going to bring us food, but it's also where we like put our stuff and like even like change our clothes or whatever. And uh, so we're sitting at the table and, and of course they always serve the band last. This makes no sense to me right? because you want the band to be playing as the people are finishing their dinner or at least starting playing or ready to play. But no, they don't do it that way. But it's fine. Whatever. It's their, you know, it's their rodeo, not mine. So all good. And, uh, so we're there and there's seven of us in the band or six of us in the band and our sound engineer. So seven total. And the kitchen staff brings out five plates and puts them all down and is like, oh my gosh, like there's two missing. And our bass player and I, for whatever reason, both said, they're like, we'll bring two more, but it's probably going to be 10 minutes. We're like, that's fine. Feed everybody else. Everybody else was really hungry. We're like, we can wait the 10 minutes. It's going to be totally fine. And everybody's like, are you sure? Even our band leader, our guitar player was like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, man, you eat. He's like, okay, thank you. So kitchen, the, the folks who delivered the food to us leave. They, you know, we pull the the covers off the food because it, you know, that comes from the kitchen. And it's like these 
dry hamburgers. It's just like burger on a bun right. and, and a, a little basket of cold French fries. Like there's no onion or tomato on the burger, nothing. We had to ask them for ketchup, right? It's the classic like vendor. You don't have in your, uh, in your little bag of tricks, you don't have any ketchup packs? With all uh, the cables and stuff, no. That's interesting. I no, I don't. That needs to go in. That's Soy a great sauce. idea. You gotta have like, you know. yeah. <laughs> so so okay, fine. So you know, this is classic like vendor meal A, the cheapest thing. That's what the right. whatever the folks that did the, the gig decided. Okay, great, fine. So everybody's eating, complaining about their thing, and they're like, well, at least when yours comes, it's probably gonna be hot. And uh, finally, you know, ten minutes later, they come out with two more. They put them down in front of us. As Vic and I, our bass player and I. Remove the covers. We see filet mignon, mashed oh, potatoes, yeah. asparagus, and it's all like cooked to perfection. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and and our band leader at that point is like, "That should have been mine." It was like, "No, you chose to take the burger." <laughs> like, hey. yeah. So, no, so that cool. was one of the better meals that I've had at uh, at a gig, just because. I- just because it was it was such a contrast to what I was expecting in that moment. So. I, I hope I hope there are people who can relate to this one, which is kind of silly. I was in a uh, a band that we played every level of venue from big to small, and the, a, a bunch of bar runs and areas because that was the gig to play and everything. Sure. And we at some point we got to the we we, we came to the realization that it, you would try. They would say, "Well, after you know, if it was two sets or whatever." You know, three sets or whatever it was, depending on where we were in some cases in like crossroads of America kind of areas, you know, you would do like three sets. You would do three oh yeah. Hours and like, wow. Oh yeah. Great. I've done some four like, setters, man. It's yeah, like, of course. yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so you're like after the first set, just, you know, put your order in and then before you go back, it'll be cool. Unfailingly without exception, you would order the food and two seconds before having to walk on to start the second set, they would bring out all the food. So we never get to eat. Like right. it eat cold constantly. food on the next set break. Yeah. Yep. All the time. And they would leave it out on, you know, in the green room or in the dressing room or if there was one in some cases. And like, you know. Or, or just on a table next to the stage. Yeah. Like, yeah it's gross. Yeah, I think I'm the, so, yeah. So I always carry stuff with me. I don't, I don't know who carries what. So if, I'd be interested to know if anybody who's listening, you know, if they, you have stuff that you carry for food or or you know snacks or before after you know not even not even like rider stuff like rider stuff at the at the higher level but like i'm talking about just like no no what do you do for bar yourself gigs, you know what yeah. do you do for you know plus you're just you know you're just in case as you like to say you know it's it's a cool thing it, it's it's always funny and I, i'll tell you one other thing that i do is if i go to a place that i'm not really sure i will actually and i do this everywhere and i've done this on the road i've done this in bars you ask the people who work there where do you eat like do you eat yeah. and they're like oh no we order from down the or there's this amazing coffee place depending on what you like and it's like a block over this way so i always ask all right so you know that our sponsor for today is our friends at banzoogle right For over 20 years, Banzoogle has made it easy to build stunning websites and online stores for our music, for our bands, for our personal projects with music, whatever it is. Well, now the folks at Banzoogle have done it again. They've added a brand new EPK plan so that musicians can create that professional single page electronic press kit in minutes. So all the features that we need to design an EPK are now already built in, including fully customizable templates, right? And we know their templates are great. We've seen them on our band's websites. Preset EPK page layouts, music players, images, text bio, and video embeds so you can really get everything in there. Your gig calendar and press quotes. And, of course, access to Banzoogle's award-winning support team, Seven days a week. Their new EPK plan starts at just $6.95 per month. And because you're a Gig Gab listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and then use the promo code GIGGABEPK. That's all one word to get 10% off the first year of this new EPK plan subscription. So that's Banzoogle.com. Promo code gig gab EPK G I G G A B E P K when you sign up to the EPK plan. And our sincere thanks for Banzoogle to, to do all this and 
for sponsoring this episode. All right, Dan. So we uh, we talked about what we do to find out what food we should eat at gigs, and I love your your question. Like, ask the wait staff, ask the bar staff, where do you eat? Ask the sound engineer, where 100%. do you eat? Right, always like, brilliant. Always, always, always. So, what gigs have you done recently? Playing, mixing. You do a lot of different things. It's, it's, you know, yeah. sound engineer, drummer, I do, teacher. I do yeah, my. But, you know, not just playing right now, the, the current project is, uh, I got a call from a friend of mine who, uh, plays in a band. He's a, a really, a really cool guitar player from New York. He said that, um, they were going to do this demo and they wanted to have a drummer come in, uh, that their regular drummer had some things going on, whatever. And I was sure. like, yeah, you know, easy enough. And I went and I went to a few of the rehearsals and had a bunch of ideas. And ultimately I ended up producing the, the demos, <laughs> Nice, which was cool. We did them at power station, which I love is one of my favorite places to record. And it's up in, up in New York, right? No, we did it. The one oh. here, the one here. Oh, the one okay. here. And it's the, it's the, the ridiculously amazing Neve console and it's all the legendary gear and everything. It's just their place here. Got it. Uh, Got it. But it's, it's a fantastic place. It's a smaller, small, much smaller facility. Sure. Really great people, really capable people and everything. So these guys call and it's a really interesting band. Uh, Jay Bernardo is the, the guy. Okay. And he's I'll, from I'll put a link to all this in the show notes yeah. at Gig Gab Podcast, of course. He's from Chile originally and then lived in Chicago and now in Miami. And the band has, you know, his flavors and then the New York guys that are in the band. There's a cellist who's Israeli, who's she's fantastic. It's very sweet. And the bass player that did the demo is uh, with me is different. Now they have a new bass player, both named Abraham, which I think is great. They, they switched great. Abe's in the middle, like, sure. like uh, Bewitched did with. Like Bewitched. <laughs> and uh, so they switched Abe's and, uh, and then I said, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, I, I have some ideas. And, and we, so this is the first single for him. He's never really done anything uh, at this level. And the band plays out and they have a really cool following. It's somewhere in that vein of, you know, the, the Guns N' Roses, um, oh. Smashing Pumpkins, that, that vote, that very upper register voice, like Midnight yep. Oil, like very, um, but the vibe is different. And it's, it's a rock band. It's very much, a, you know, a rock and roll band. Sure, sure. So when I started to work on this and we sort of decided to dive in and what was I going to do, I wanted the production team to be very specific. So I brought in Brandon, uh, Brandon Platt, who's, who's from South Africa, and he was really well known in this band called Red Helen. So if okay. you know like really hard, heavy, dark metal bands from South Africa, the, you know, the really serious, sure. he was the front man who also happens to be a world-class engineer who works on, uh, the, 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 uh, 20k podcast for de facto sound oh, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. uh works for disney and nickelodeon and amazon prime video and discovery channel and he's done stuff with trevor noah and the bbc's like incredible engineer and he also works with me on one of the uh broadcast facilities for one of the bigger churches which is amazing and they have the best the best broadcast sound i've ever heard and it's him he's yeah. amazing at what he does and and just so uh, listeners know you wind up doing a lot of sound and sound design for churches in your area. That's that's no, one of your regular area, gigs. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so I have consulting work that I do in the worship market um, in different parts of the country, both through Got it. some of the planting organizations and just through relationships I've had um, that started out years ago when I came off the road and one of the musicians called me and said, hey, you wouldn't want to come and mix this church gig. And this was at the very, very beginning of ccm and sure and it was full lights full production full tour level stuff and and it was an easy fit for me so that yeah. started that and then from there they would you know as they would change people they would call me to go in and help train or whatever and yeah. i stay very current with with 
production and gear and, and mixing and training and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so anyway, I, from, I didn't mean to totally yeah, no, no, derail. No, no. I just wanted to so, contextualize that. Yeah, for we folks. can. That, then there's something to be said for that because a the, lot of it applies to what the show talks about 100%. in ways that you you wouldn't even believe. And I want and I have something I was thinking about too. Okay, because I want to do a little I want to do a little gear gab as we as we roll through. Right. If we have well, well, I mean. This we'll have. We're gonna have. This is gonna happen regularly. Like right, cool. Yeah. yeah you know, so uh, you, it's all good. I say yeah. you call. I go. Yeah. So great. perfect. Dave Bang Drum. Dan talk. It's good. So, <laughs> so <laughs> love it. So so the mastering side of this. I said, well, if I'm gonna have Brandon do this, Brandon's amazing. We're gonna have equally high quality mastering. So Dave Collins, who's the engineer for the mastering engineer for like Buck Cherry and Springsteen oh, yeah. and Seth MacFarlane, Metallica, John Bon Jovi. Like I wanted somebody who understood Sting and Willow Smith. He's done all this stuff, but somebody who understood this is a rock band. It's like a heavy rock band. Yep. It's an alt pop rock kind of a feel, but you have to, you have to understand that their vibe is, is the groove of the band. And at the same time, you know, there's this, like I said, this very, um, very much like smashing pumpkins kind of an energy to it particularly vocally so sure. that was a really important thing and so these guys man they just they just crushed it i mean it, it's it doesn't awesome. sound like it's it's fa it feels familiar so i got to both play on the set play in the sessions and produce and so the first the first single uh was released i don't know maybe it was right before christmas and the song, the way I produce, and I don't know if we've ever done anything together like this. I have, I call it the Bolero effect. You know, Bolero starts very, very simple in Ravel's yep. piece. Bolero starts very, very quiet and peace, and it builds and builds and builds and builds. And, and by the time you get to the end, you're down, but you know, just, that's right, the idea. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's my philosophy. Yep. Okay. Any song, I want to hear it, you know, at its core. And so that's what we did. So I took these two songs. <clears throat> pardon me, which are very similar. And I said, well, we'll do it this way. And um, we we rehearsed it. And I said to to Steve, the guitar player, I said, dude, put all of it, put, leave it all on the table, dude. Like I want, so by the time you hit the guitar solo, it just, boom, and he opens just, up, he just goes and they do this live and it's to make that anybody who's done this and i know a million people who listen to the show who will tell you like getting the live thing to translate into the studio it's tough is you, there's because it's you have to it has to be like a spiritual experience it has to be you that thing yes feel, you it has to make you weep like you're like you're listening to Isaac perlman or something like it's got to be that energy so it's hard it, and it and the right producer really even if you're self-producing if, if you're if, if you or your bandmates or collectively you are the right producer for yourselves that can work too but yeah. whoever is if someone needs to be in that role actively and with the right person in that producer role it really can help elevate what happens in the studio to match the the passion that comes out live yeah. And even if it's different, like sometimes it's, you end up with something totally different. Of but course. You want, there's nothing you want more it to be inspiring. Yeah. Right. It's so disappointing if you if you see a band live and then you hear the studio version of the song, you go like, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I want to go. I'm gonna so, I'm gonna yeah. detour us a little bit here because yeah. I I think you know, a lot of us that are here and listening to this show and part of the gig gap community, we find ourselves in the studio regularly. Most people who listen that are musicians, and I know we have quite a few listeners who are not musicians. That's also okay. You're, you're here because you like and these that's, conversations that's okay. that would normally be boring at cocktail parties. Right. Um, but the, the importance of that producer role and the importance of capturing the vibe in the studio is not something that happens automatically. It is a skill that is developed. And so I'm curious to, from you, like it is a skill that you have developed over the years going in. And I know every scenario is different, but your approach, at least on day one, probably has some similarities with your approach on day one to any project. What are the things that you have found, you know, top three, maybe, and I know I'm putting you on the spot with this, that, really as 
it, when you're in the role of producer, what are those top three things that you find really help to get a band, you know, above the, the, the sterile sound that can come out when red light, you know, when, when you're recording, AKA red light syndrome. Right. right. Okay. So that's actually kind of an easy thing to acknowledge Great. and respond to. Okay. The first thing is something that I was taught when I did my first demo, when I was a kid, I got the opportunity to work with uh, Rob Freeman, who was the producer for, or the engineer for the Go-Go's and, and a ton of people. Okay. And just the coolest guy. And so I came down to Miami and, and worked with him. And he said something to me that stayed with me my entire life. And it's something that I use now with everything I do is he said, if you were in Madison Square Garden sold out, in center stage and they put a pin spot on you and said, play the song on just the acoustic guitar or piano, just you and the instrument, does the song stand up? Number one. Number two, you know, what's the reaction? And so yep. that's how I pick my songs. So whenever I sit with somebody, I say, okay, I don't want to hear what you've done with it. I want you to just play me the song. Sit down, play me the song. And then let me hear if the song is a good song. Yep. And, uh, you know, then, then it makes it easier for me to decide. And that's something from, uh, what was it? That's the show Daisy Jones and the six. Oh yeah. The Daisy Jones one. and the six. Yeah. 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 Love that. And I know some of the backstory to that. And I, I know some of the people, you know, mm -hmm. that it's loosely based on and right. that they talk about that. They're like, yeah, the song, the song sucks. The song sucks. But you know, when it's a good song, you know, that's a good song. This is, this is, if it, if it doesn't start at its core as a, as a song that speaks to you or has a purpose or, or musically makes more sense, then sometimes it's just a fun song to play. It doesn't sure. mean it's going to translate to the studio. Okay? It doesn't. So right. Right. That's so that, one. okay. So that's number one. Okay. All number, right. Number two is that in my head, I want to know what the artist expects from me. Because if I try to superimpose my ideas onto what they're doing, then it's, it doesn't work. What do you hear? What do you, what is your goal? What do you hear? What do you want it to be? If there is something, sometimes there isn't sure. anything. Sometimes they don't know. And, yeah. and so we, we sort of feel it out. And I like the give and take of that. I like to say, okay, let's try this. If it works, it works, whatever. Um, one of the things that I did with, with Jay's band uh, which was really cool was I like to draw stuff out of people. And okay. So yeah. I'll, that That's really what I'm like. Yeah. That's what so, I'm looking for is what are your tricks for doing that? So yeah. I do, I do a couple of things. One is I will tell them up front what I said earlier, which is you have to go to that place. Even if it's uncomfortable, you have to, it's a conversation. Yeah. Uh, you have to be playing what you would say to somebody if you were standing in their face and you could say whatever you needed to say. Okay, that's number one. Number two is you have to be very deliberate. Uh, that was Marvin Mc Marvin McQuitty mm -hmm. taught me that. Uh, the late great drummer whom I adored and said, you know, anything that you do, particularly as a drummer, you, you don't you don't go at it, you know, easily. You have to be very clear about your intent. It's not about dynamics. It's about well, it's playing like, with confidence. Hit it like you mean it. Yeah. Understand what you're doing. Be prepared and go for it. And he, it, what was his famous quote? You don't, you don't hit it. You, you punch a hole in it or something. To <laughs> I like you it. Know? Yeah. And sure. It is, and that doesn't mean hit hard. It means no. Be intentional. So that's my other thing. And the, the last thing that I do is, once I know what I'm working with or who I'm dealing with, how can I help make it better? I, I need to be a part of the band. Because as a yep. musician, I get it, but at the same time, I also hear. I go like, "That's not it. That's not it." Um, sometimes they they go at it too hard, and they really dig in. And like, so we. I just had the experience with Jay, where where Shira, the cellist, uh, we were talking, and she she. Very I love that there's sweet. another rock band with a cellist out there. Yeah. This is this is great. I love she it. She said. <laughs> she said, "Will you will you sit in the room with me?" And so, and there's a great, there's a video somewhere of it. And yep. I went and I sat on the floor next to her and just sat there in silence and just sort of conducted a little bit. And cause she does classical, cause she does all this other stuff too. And, and she just crushed it. I mean, like just the subtle, you know, but you gave, you stuff. gave her the ability to interact with another human while doing this 
what could have been sterile performance for the tape. Right. Yeah. And, and, but that like, I think that is brilliant because that's what's needed. Sometimes you, you have to figure out how to be their audience. I think as a, as a producer, right. You, you almost want to put them in a position where they need to impress you. And, and, and like, that, that, it's, not, I don't, it's, it's not impressing me. But impress it's, is the wrong term. They're performing for you. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's a better yeah. way to put it. And yeah. and I think that's the thing about any of the people that I've that I've been able to to both play and produce with is is that it's it it has to be real. Look, this is a time and certainly it's been mentioned on the show a million times. You know, the difference between, you know, a studio and a home studio now, the home studios have gotten to the point where they're kind of amazing. Can sound great. Yeah. They can and, sound great. Right. Yeah. There there is a richness to being in a room that sounds like a room. And even though yeah. you can recreate that now in a lot of ways, and, and it's great. I mean, it's better than it's ever been. When certainly in terms of what what's possible, but to capture a moment. You know, it's like everybody walks around with an iPhone or, or some sort of phone and they take pictures constantly. But anytime you see an, a really compelling image on social media, you know it was a Nikon or, you know, yeah. you, can, you can see the depth. There's, a, there's a, 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 a realism that sets it apart. No matter how great your phone is, sure, you won't capture, you know. And well, I think, another I think, no, I, I think what you're saying there, there's a there's a one to one correlation because what makes current smartphone and this is me putting on my nerd hat so please folks forgive me, uh, but what makes current smartphone especially Apple's but they're like the, the Google phones and some of the Samsung ones have this too, what makes the pictures that come from them so spectacular and they are spectacular, is not the lenses because the lenses as good as they could be they're tiny. It's the computational photography, the, the, the smarts that software engineers have put into pulling as much data as they can out of these tiny little lenses and then extrapolating that using machine learning or what we now call AI to, uh, to really sort of make it more than it really is and make right. it seem like it came from a camera that's, that's more powerful than, than the lens that's on, on your phone. What's happening in home studios is the same thing, right? Exactly. It's software that, I mean, yes, we have good microphones for good prices, but still you're, you know, you're in a small room most likely that doesn't sound all that great. Right. And so you mic things as closely as you can. And then you add software, aka okay, plugins. And we'll talk about some of those in a little bit here yes. that, uh, that opens all that up, right. And makes it sound more than it is. It's exactly. the same thing. And it's yep. amazing that we get to live in this world. Don't get me wrong, but I'm with you. Absolutely. It's it's just different. But yep. yeah. yeah. One of my favorite producer moments was when, and this was, man, 25 years ago or something, maybe 30 years ago. I was in the studio recording for a friend. It, it was a long day at, like, at my day job. Then I had to pack my drums in the car, drive to the studio, it was, which was like an hour away, set up. And start going. And then it was like four hours of recording. So I, I came into this, you know, exhausted. And I was playing this tune for my friend Brad. And we finished a take. <laughs> and the engineer, who I knew. And so you have to develop a rapport when you're producing someone. And he he and I had a rapport. But I hear in my headphones him say, so what is, and it's this a rock song. Like, there's no question about it. It's like a rock song. It's a straight two and four groove. He's like, so what is this supposed to be some kind of jazzier number or whatever? He's like, why aren't you really digging it? <laughs> but it was the right thing to say in that moment to get me to say like, screw you, buddy. Like roll the tape again. Let's go. Which is what he wanted. He needed to rile me up a little, but he knew that. And he right. like, that's the, the, the job of a producer. You don't always rile somebody up. You have to know if that's the right thing to do. But sure. in that moment, he knew that that was the right thing for me. I was like, damn it. It's freaking roll the tape. Let's go. You know, do the and thing. Do the thing, and then we pounded it out. And it was, it was. He was like, "Oh, that's what this song's supposed to be like." And I'm like, yeah. mm, "You're testing my patience." <laughs> yeah, and it's funny talking about all these like home studio tricks and everything that we can do now. 
is one of the things I actually wanted to talk about it with some of the gear and and let's go to gear gab, yeah, and, man, and spinning around with the whole Nam aspect of it is is I have very high expectations. There are things that we are due to see from some of these companies. Um, one of the things that for the live end of things that I think is really cool for the people who listen to this show is the fact that you know when Waves put out Super Rack Performer. Yep. at 99 bucks suddenly all you needed was a, a a obviously powerful enough macbook pro or it's or something sure. it's equivalent and a usb cable and almost any of the digital consoles i mean the stuff you use you know even the you know any of the rack digitals yeah. and and suddenly you have access to you know all kinds of stuff and now with you know, Apple Silicon and, and some of the stuff that's happening and the fact that there are lower latency plugins. Now, sometimes you get both. They're actually giving, so like Waves came out with, uh, let, let me preface this a little bit. Sure. For a really long time, I was not a Waves guy. Okay. And Fair. when all of the worship market sort of embraced it, I, I've had Super Rack in my studio. I use some of the things when people request it and there's some stuff that I really like and there's some great, pieces to it and it's capable of sounding very very good compared to you know uad stuff to me which is a much richer and far more expensive <laughs> alternative far more expensive um for what you need waves was like okay you know just hang on for a second we'll, sure. we're, we're gonna get to this and everything. we got you yep <laughs> and then when they changed over to the low latency and for a while they were like suffixed ll you know low, yeah you know, no some of those i, were like, LL, like, I couldn't oh. deal with waves plugins for the podcast for the longest time because i do it all real time like yeah, i am right. it, 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 if i hear my voice on delay too much like forget it i'm out but so now yeah all the obvious ones aside because we know the emulation of like every oops, excuse me of every like you know, all the compressors of all kinds, API 2500s and, sure. and the DBX 160s and all that. It's great. The the Fairchild, the, the, the Puig Child, you know, stuff is, is fantastic. There, You have all those things, the 1176, you have all those things. Okay, great. All that aside, when we look at what's new, what's new. And so for me, when I do consulting for any of the companies that I work with, either in Pro Audio or in, in MI or whatever it is, I have three things that I ask them. How is it different? How is it better? And who's going to want it? These are good questions you know? To, to know when you're going to go market something. Right. And and if you're asking me to help you design the product before. Oh, even even better. I, right. have, to, yeah. I, have, to, I have to be all about it. When it came to this, this stuff and the fact that I'm using it every week and I'm training on it every week, when I went to them and said, I'm going to take my consultant side in my training side and my mixing live sound side and say, okay, how is it better? How is it different? Who's going to want it? And Waves has some really cool responses. I so, give them credit. What are, the what are, yeah, tell us is, about a couple. I have yeah, to please. talk, I have to talk, I was, the, the obvious one is, and they, they've marketed it on social media to death. It's called Silk and okay. it's a vocal AI processor that you, it's easy to overuse like all their stuff. Like you, sure. you really need to, one of the other great things that Rob Freeman taught me as a kid was anytime you use any effect at all, you, you add it until you can hear it and then you back it off a little. And then you back it off. You That's never, right. ever, ever want people to say like, Hey, it's, I hear that effect or I hear that. No, like, unless right you're being now, very deliberate you, in your share or T-Pain or something. If you're listening the to the audio version of this podcast, if you hear the reverb that I have added on, I've added too much, but I haven't because I can hear it too. And mm -hmm. I add reverb to make it sound like you and I are in the same room, not in two separate rooms in two separate states, 1800 miles apart. And then I add it in and I hear it and then I back it off just a touch. And it really does. But if I mute it, if like, if I take this reverb, if you're listening now, it sounds dry, right? But now it doesn't. And yet you didn't know there was reverb there until I told you. Yeah. That. And that's, that's with anything. 
Yes. Uh, and I, and I like that philosophy. It's, and again, it, there are exceptions and that's fine. If you're, if you're really hard, you know, auto tuning for effect or whatever, that's fine. So sure, yes, yes. It can be used as an effect. That's totally fine. Yeah, I mean, listen yeah, to the, the you know, the drums on in the air tonight are, were epic sure. for, for many reasons. And one of them was the, the effects. So yeah, yep. absolutely. So this, this, this plugin silk, which I, again, I was sort of resistant to in the beginning. And then a buddy of mine said, you know, they give you the LL one with it. And I said, I'm sorry, oh. say that one more time real quick for me. Um, I need to try this thing. Wow. It's, really? it's easily overused, but okay. it looks for the peaks and valleys and it says, uh, let's just relax that a little bit. And it, it literally smooths out as silk. It looks like a silky, yeah. it's beautiful. And, and to be honest with you, I haven't messed with the studio version. I haven't had any occasion to it, to use it. And I don't use waves as much in my studio life. So, but um, you've been using silk live or you've tested I, it live. I've messed with it and it's, it's really cool. It doesn't work gotta, for I everyone, but it's really, it's really surprising when you, when you, you just start messing with it, you massage it and you kind of go like, huh? Well, and then you bypass and then yeah. you put it back, you bypass and you're like, well, that is better, isn't it? <laughs> that That's my favorite kind of, of, especially for vocals and, and it spoken word too. I am surprised I haven't messed with this particular waves plugin. I will for a future episode because it might be the magic for bringing like your sound is great today. It's Thankfully, so crazy. we do a, we do a you know this show is for musicians, which means most people who come on even as a, a quote unquote guest like they understand sound. It's way better than my other shows, right? Like, <laughs> but even still, like a little something to to pepper in to smooth it out. I'm I'm not opposed to yeah, that. No, so. I'm I'm cool with that. This is yep. this is one of those things. This was one of those plugins, like most plugins, that I said, well, you know, I already have an F6 and I already have my, you know, 1176, like, and I can probably do all these things. And I have the, P, you know, I have the, the PSC and I have all the stuff that like, like, okay, let's, let's just actually try them. And I, yeah. going back and forth and I really, really tried it. And I've had this experience with a few of the plugins that Waves, that Waves handles. And there are some that I will tell you flat out, I just do not like. Some of, of them are oh, very uh, wildly popular. Of course. But like, and, and this is an important thing. So this one, as it happens, depending on the voice and depending on what you want to do with it, it's, it's just cool. Plus it's got a toy quality. Do you want to play with it? You just want to do stuff and see what it sounds like. And I want to, really I want to, cool. I want to contextualize what you just said. You said toy quality because you want to play with it, not toy quality because it's not pro. It is, it is like a pro it level is, thing. It is. Yeah. It is a a professional product that uh, you will hear on more records. I, uh, it, it's very cool. All right, cool. here's the second and one. And it's sixty I don't bucks. Out on stuff. It's yeah. sixty bucks right, right now. And, so, and yeah. needless to say, Waves has a sale every other hour. Right. So you just once you pay attention, it pops up constantly, and they or buy two get you know whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. The other one, which is cool, which I think people who listen to this show will love, is called Feedback Hunter. <gasps> Okay, yep. and it is a live tool. And so if you are in a position where you can splurge on the 99 bucks to get performer and run it off your, and I, by the way, if you do use a MacBook Pro or whatever you use, if you're gonna use this live, dedicate it to that purpose. Yes. Don't like set up a user that only you don't want any background, anything you don't want, you know, you want to be able to drop your buffer a little bit so that you don't have any latency at all. If you're running 16 channels or 24 yeah. channels or whatever you're running. Yeah. What this does for monitors, if you're using wedges is epic because you basically, it's a, it's a press the button and go and you sweep through everything and it finds all your, your ringing and it's gone like that. And then you can crank up your wedges. Huh. They, they recommend it for front of house. I, it's not for me for front of house. Okay. That's if fair. You're, if you're using, yeah. if you're even like, and I don't say that, like, I'm not trying to be pretentious where you're like on a, sure, sure. on a line array or whatever. Like if you have a, if you have an Eon system or if you have a, a Bose system or whatever it is that you're running and it's portable and you set it up and you go like, Zoom, if you don't have the means to EQ it either in your whatever mixer or analog digital, whatever it is that you're doing to actually go through and, and pull for the room, then yes, it, it's, it's a quick and dirty jump yep. into to EQ. It doesn't, 
it doesn't read the room for me the right way. And no, yes, I get it. Can, it you can it's adjust functional, it to, right. functional, not musical. Would that yeah. be the right way to say yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, it gets the job done and yep. you definitely can back off and use as much as you want. Sure. Uh, but I, for wedges, would, what yeah, a great wedges, it's tool. Awesome. Yeah. And Especially it's 99 for bucks. A drummer. Yeah. It's, oh. it's really, really cool. So that's, that's something cool. I am of the hope and expectation that, you know, Nam will, will produce some new consoles. A lot of the companies are getting a little long in the tooth in their, in their top end, but well, Alan and Heath has this new compact. Uh, yeah. We get, I was going to say we're, we're at like an hour and five minutes. Yeah. So, so there's stuff I'm expecting. I, okay. I want to see more stuff. I want more stuff, Dave. Well, I want more stuff too. I want to like, see more. I want to hear the greatness. Like I really yeah. do. I love, you know, you the same way. I love gear. I love learning about it. I stay as current. I, every day I look for like, who's going to have what, what's it going to be? And so that's what I'm, that's my thing. Okay. And well, cool. Cool we'll have coming. you, I want to have you back after Nam to talk about gear, whether it was gear that you found at Nam that you're excited about, or you can say I was disappointed, but here's other gear anyway. And we'll, we'll gear gab ourselves into, uh, into a whole other episode. Oh yeah, and if you're going, if you're going to be at Nam, oh, yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah, for sure. We're doing that. Okay. All right. I got to figure it out. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm close. I'm close. I got it. You know, it's, it's prove it. I know. <laughs> I know. It's like the worst time of year for me to travel oh, it's again. Well, you <sighs> know, when we first started hanging out, I was going. It was, you know, it was Macworld, CES, NAM awards shows, home. Yeah, there were a lot of people like you that, like, once was, they arrived at Macworld, they wouldn't be home no. for the month of January. Yeah, just January go, was gone. Go from, I, yeah, I am sad that, it, that there are parts of me that are sad that Macworld Expo does not happen anymore. The part of me that has to go to CES is not sad about Macworld Expo not happening <laughs> because yes. it was, you would like, People would leave their booths at Macworld. Macworld always would slot itself in just ahead of CES so that they could have the first announcements of the year. Like that, this was super important. There was this competition between the two shows. But some companies would literally pack up their booths a day early from Macworld so they could go set up and be there yep. for opening day of CES. I it was that. ludicrous. It was like, guys, figure it out together. Like, you can't do this. It's the same industry. So... That part of Macworld, I don't miss. It was kooky. It we was kooky. Fun, though. We did. We We'd, oh, we had. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's other things now. We, you know, we have yes. Nam and CES, and things have evolved, and the world changes. And this, this awesome show that you have, which is I, all of your awesome shows, by the way. Thanks, man. Yeah, almost you nine know, years. You know, I'm always, a, and you know the, and I've said it before. This is the this is the podcast that I listen to, not only religiously, but. It's the one that I yell back at. Like I'm working out and I have my AirPods in. And I'm like, hey, that's not, that, no, don't do that. And you know, I'll don't text you right way. then. I've texted you like right in the moment. Like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Love, I, and love, I appreciate love, those love. texts. I, 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 there, and there are no, several of you awesome. for this show and, and, yeah. and my other shows where like, I, as soon as the episode comes out, you know, the texts will start coming in within like the first 30 minutes. And it's, I, it's great. Like I, I love I love learning things. And so yeah. I, and I like to be right. I am not emotionally committed to having been right. Right. I would, I like, I, I don't like telling people things that are wrong. Like that bothers me. But if I say something and I am wrong, I love it when people send in a thing and they're like, no, 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 no. Do it this way. It's like, Oh, thank you. That's great. So yeah, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I love it. It's great. Yeah, it's important, and it's. I think it. I think you've done something else too. And and I don't. And just to wrap this up, is one of the things that you you and Paul have done very successfully, is to say to people, just because you can do something one way or the other way doesn't mean you have to. Like, there's taste involved. So like yeah. you like here's this microphone like you did with the battery mics. You're like here, this microphone, yeah, it's a great deal. It's it's awesome. But try it and see if you like it. Like. That's the thing. Like that's it, the it thing. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care what it is. You, yes, it might do the job. It might get the job. Yes, you can make anything sound its best if you know what you're doing. But at the end of the day, if you don't like it, you're going to torture yourself. And so yep. the way you've been able to present things and options has been really cool. And well, I, thanks I for saying that. that a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah, because I, 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 I think it's obvious. I agree with you. It's, it's, it's. 
everything is a tool. You, you just, but do you, is it the tool you would reach for if you had all of the options? That's kind of the way I approach it. And some tools, I don't have the option because I don't have 10 grand for the, you know, a, a, a 251 mic, right? So I, I bought one that's, you know, a clone of it that's 600 bucks it's, yeah. and it sounds great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, if and, it sounds and, good. And I have this rule that I teach when I, when I train engineers, Yeah, I've said this for years and years and years. I don't care if it's green and fuzzy, if you, if it sounds good, I don't care what it looks like because I'm not looking at it. If it's something that's meant to be discreet is one thing, or if you're, you know, whatever sure. it is, I don't care what it looks like. If, and I also don't care how you get from A to B, as long as you get to B. Get to B. That's it. Yes. <laughs> that's that kind of stuff. So yeah, man. it's awesome, man. I, I just, I always love hanging with you. And Well, thanks for, thanks for hanging. Uh, tell people where they can find more about you or follow you if, uh, if, yeah. if they so um, choose. Depending on which, which me, um, my website is danieleast.net. Uh, and that's sort of the hub for my musical activities and actually Great. some of my recipes too, because I do cook a little bit. You do cook. I, and your and wife I, has made the soup, as I understand it. We have made the soup here. It's freaking yeah. delicious, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. Story for another day. Um, yep. And so there, and then uh, my social for mixing, which is mostly in the worship market, is at The Mix Doctor, at The Mix, mix Doctor. And, um, other than that, it's East D at East D. But nice. the, my background is, is the links to everything are pretty much on my main website. Great. LinkedIn has all the bio crazy. So you can always cool. find me there too. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us folks. I am going to share something that I have been meaning to share on this show for probably a year since I set it up. We have a mailing list, you know, mm -hmm. where we send out the show notes every time there's an episode posted. It's right there at gigabpodcast.com. So go sign up for the many of you have already signed up. Even uh, are I'm you on it. Uh, are you on, on it? it? All right, there you I'm go. You well, I, I I've never told anyone about it. I don't like that's a failure on my part. You, did, you mentioned it once on the show. Did I mention it once? Maybe, okay. maybe once, maybe twice. Uh, I'm not, I I don't know about that, but maybe things happen. I forget. Grub gab. Just remember grub. Grub gab. I know I gotta go get that URL now. So uh whether it's grub, gag or grub Gab or Gig Gab, easy for me to say. What are those three magic words, my friend? Always be performing. Sweet. We're out. That's great. <laughs>